Yeah. Great. We are. Okay, so I'm really excited to be here today. I can't remember when this invitation first came, but I'm pretty sure it's pre-pandemic. So I'm excited uh, to be here to talk to you about life and oceans uh, and the Earth's ocean and the worlds beyond. I, um, because many of you are educators and I have two children, I know you guys always have a plan. So I thought I would tell you my plan for the next 40 minutes, uh, which is to tell you a bit about the work we do in my lab, uh, while also trying to connect the basic research and discovery with some of the larger issues uh, relevant to all of our lives. So I hope you walk away with a greater understanding of what the bottom of the ocean looks like, who lives there, why it's worth studying, and what we'll need to under what we still need to, to understand uh, about this amazing ecosystem. Uh, but first, I thought I would introduce myself. This is something we do whenever we bring new students into the lab, particularly students who maybe don't have a, um, a clear sense of what is a pathway into a career in STEM. And so everybody in the lab puts together slides about this is how I got here. Um, this is what maybe I'd be doing if I wasn't doing this. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself. I didn't grow up here. I'm not from New England. I'm from the mighty Midwest, um, and most of my exposure to the ocean came from television and the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. Um, and so I had a very biased view of what the ocean was like. I thought it was all about coral reefs and dolphins uh, based on those experiences um, until I found this book at the Toledo Public Library uh, when I was about 13. This is Rachel Carson's The Sea Around Us. This predates Silent Spring. Um, and it was sort of the first time I had read something that talked about the ocean in this kind of dark and mysterious way. You know, this was written in the 50s. We didn't even know about plate tectonics, but it really made me think about the ocean more broadly um, and uh, inspired me to, to pursue this career, which was not a very common career aspiration uh, for kids where I grew up. Um, but being good Midwesterners, my parents didn't want me to go west of the Mississippi. So I went as far as I could uh, to Florida where I uh, went to a small liberal arts college called Eckerd College. And it was there that I really learned about marine microbes. I learned about geology. I learned about chemistry. And it sort of sparked this path into the deep ocean. So I then drove my car across the country. And by this time, I was old enough to go west of the Mississippi um, to the University of Washington, where I worked mostly offshore um, in deep sea hydrothermal vents, but also got exposed to planetary science in the field, the new field of astrobiology. Uh, I moved to one more big drive across the country to Woods Hole, where I've been since uh, 2005, uh, you know, growing my lab, also, you know, raising my family here. My kids have no idea how lucky they are living in this gorgeous place. Um, but, you know, Woods Hole Ocean Graphic is where I've been able to kind of realize my vision of what a lab group can and should look like. Um, I also really value talking to different types of people about science and education, so I'm really excited to be here today. So, oh, and my alternate career would be a TV critic. I really, um, I, love, I, it's, I love watching TV and I love reading other TV critics articles about the shows I just watched. So that's what I think my alternative career would be because I could sit on the couch all day and then write scathing um, articles. I think that'd be a lot of fun. So uh, this cartoon kind of describes what I do in my career is I use advanced robotic technology to study weird life at the bottom of the ocean. And that's what we're going to be talking about for basically the first half uh, of this talk. Uh, and the habitat I study is in the deepest parts of the ocean. And this is actually one of my favorite maps of the ocean, which is a little bit weird because uh, the ocean water has been subtracted. Uh, I like it though, because you can see the amazing features of the seafloor across these large swaths of blue that cover 70% of our planet's surface. So some of the seafloor is covered in sediments built up over thousands of years of biological activity. But beneath it all is this rocky ocean crust, which is the habitat I study. And many of the features you see on the seafloor are due to the process of plate te tectonics uh, with ocean crust constantly being formed and mid-ocean ridges. And this creates, in fact, the world's longest mountain range, which runs through the Atlantic, Indian, and Pacific oceans. Uh, you also have places where plates slam into each other, they slide underneath one another. Uh, and in many of these areas, there's volcanic activity as well. And actually about 75% of the volcanic activity on our planet occurs uh, underwater. So uh, I am also a microbiologist and in looking at your gender, you're gonna hear a lot about microbes. So I'm not gonna dwell on this, 
Um, but I do want to make it clear that I am studying this crustal ocean biosphere very much focused on single-celled organisms. So this is a DNA-based tree of life on our planet showing the main domains. We're located way out on the right there with the eukaryotes. And the rest of the tree are single-cell microbes um, within the bacteria and the archaeal domains. And you know, the reason there's so many branches in this tree is because microbes have had billions of years to evolve and diversify and fill almost every environment on our planet. So our planet is about four and a half billion years old. Microbial life is thought to originate between about 3.5 and 3.8 billion years. And microbes do all sorts of important things on our planet and our human health, but you have an entire talk about microbiomes later. So I'm gonna leave it to that speaker. What we study though in the, these rocky habitats, which we've termed the crustal ocean biosphere is really not only the invisible microscopic life, but also the visible animals in these habitats. So basically the crustal ocean biosphere is rocks and life. So uh, I wanted to give you a sense of what these look like. So the, probably the most familiar are these black smoker chimneys. So these are formed when seawater reacts with a heat source beneath the seafloor, it's chemically modified, and all these minerals precipitate when that hot buoyant fluid returns to the deep ocean, producing these sulfide chimneys. These are from the Western Pacific near Guam along the Mariana back arc. These fluids can also mix with seawater within the crust and they produce these much lower temperature fluids. Uh, basically all the shimmery stuff you see in this video, this is from the Galapagos. This is where hydrothermal vents were first discovered in 1977. And these two worms thrive in this environment because they're chock full of symbiotic microbes. So whereas we might eat a salad or a hamburger for dinner, these microbes are eating hydrogen sulfide, converting chemical energy into organic carbon or a salad for these worms. So until we had this discovery uh, in the late 70s, we actually had no idea that complex ecosystems could be supported this way without power from the sun. I suspect this third example is not really familiar. Uh, this amazing firework display of lava bombs is West Mata Volcano. This is located near Samoa in the Western Pacific. Uh, until we captured this video in 2009 with a remotely operated vehicle, this type of sort of pyroclastic eruptive activity had never been seen in the ocean before which is remarkable given scientists think it's actually been occurring on our planet for billions of years. Also in the Western Pacific, but further north along the Mariana Arc is another crazy site. Uh, this is Daikoku Volcano. This type of volcano is formed when a subducting plate remelts and it kind of creates this otherworldly scene of molten sulfur and super gassy acidic fluids. This is in Japanese waters. And finally, we have an example of uh, no longer volcanically active, but still really important rocky seafloor habitat, and that is seamounts. This is Davidson Seamount off the coast of California. Uh, there's millions of seamounts in the ocean. We just read about a Navy submarine running into one. These are biological hotspots of activity in the ocean due to nutrient upwelling, and there's a lot of availability of hard substrates, which lots of animals use. And in this uh, example, the specific example, uh, octopus. So, now these sites, they're not just really beautiful to look at, of course, uh, they also provide a lot of critical ecosystem services um, to us, for us earth residents. So this includes provisioning, supporting, regulating, and cultural services. So for example, we know that deep sea organisms are a source of discovery of valuable new products, uh, marine genetic resources. This includes anti-cancer products, novel enzymes for industry, uh, microbes in the deep sea also support those diverse animal communities and food webs, as I showed you in those videos and we'll talk about in the next slide. These environments also help regulate climate in the form of carbon sequestration, which is shown here with methane hydrates. And of course, they have important cultural and educational value. They're kind of key in basic scientific research from understanding the origin of life to life beyond, which we'll also talk about. But despite our knowledge of these ecosystem services, uh, this ocean crustal biosphere remains largely unexplored and with few sites characterize the magnitude of these services unknown. And I'm gonna return this to this in the end, you know, how can we put a value on this type of environment? So now I wanna dive just a little bit into how life is gaining energy in these rocky environments. But first I need to make sure you understand how it works in the ocean more broadly. This is a really complicated schematic showing kind of the marine food web in the surface ocean, which is a really well-described process. Um, this is based on primary producers in the form of phytoplankton or photosynthetic bacteria. 
that kind of form the base of the food chain, right? So they, they're, they're transferring that inorganic carbon into dissolved and particulate organic carbon. Um, and then they respire that. And this is sort of this microbial loop, which is shown in the purple, purple arrow. And then things feed up into you know, other life forms like fish. Um, so we can really simplify this, um, the microbial component of this. So again, at the top, we have these primary producers, again, using energy from the sun. That organic matter is then transferred to heterotrophic microbes who eat that carbon. And then a lot of different things can happen to both the carbon and those life forms. Um, they can get consumed uh, by grazers. They can also get um, you know, lysed or killed by viruses. Um, we really only hear about these, and especially in these times, in a really negative way, but viruses are actually a really important part of this microbial loop and recycling organic matter in the ocean. Um, and this is an emerging field that my lab is trying to tackle, especially in the deep ocean. So this is how it works in the surface ocean. And what I want to do is just kind of flip this over and think about how it works in these chemosynthetic environments in the deep sea. So instead of sunlight now, our primary producers are these chemolithoautotrophic. So chemistry, rocks, fixing their own carbon, bacteria and archaea, they're using chemical energy from these deep sea vents. And so they are the first step in this microbial loop. Um, so we have a lot of the same key players, primary producers, heterotrophs, viruses, and grazers, but obviously the ecosystem looks really different um, as those videos I showed you indicates. So despite studying these really small life forms, I get to use a lot of fancy technology just to get my samples. Um, and in the last few decades, our access to the deep ocean has increased remarkably. Uh, this is due to a lot of different institutions um, contributing. I'm of course gonna focus on who we were, I work, um, but here I'm showing four vehicles that we currently operated, operate. That includes the human-occupied uh, vehicle Alvin, which is up there on the left. This was originally commissioned by the Navy, and uh, it's actually out in new sea trials right now, uh, increasing its depth to 6,500 meters. Uh, Alvin launches after breakfast with two scientists and a pilot. It swims free of the ship to do your work, uh, and then you come back around five o'clock or dinner time um, with your samples in hand. The rest of these vehicles involve scientists and pilots staying safely aboard the ship while all the, ve the vehicle does the work beneath the surface. So this includes the remotely operated vehicle Jason up in the upper right, which can travel to 6,500 meters. And since there are no people on the vehicle, it can stay on the seafloor for days on end. I think its longest dive is nine days. Uh, we use a multitude of screens to kind of recreate the, the 3D world into 2D. Uh, down there on the left is a vehicle still in development at Hui. It's called NUI. It's an under ice vehicle that uses a thin fiber optic cable, uh, cable to do remote exploration under uh, sea ice, such as in the Arctic or the Antarctic Shelf. Uh, and finally on the right, uh, this is Sentry. This is an autonomous underwater vehicle. It's programmed to basically make a map, run a course, and do other underwater tasks um, completely without people involved and uh, free from the ship. And we often use, you know, Alvin and Sentry together or Jason and Sentry together on the same ship running ops uh, simultaneously. Uh, back in the lab, we touch on many fields and techniques um, to study these extraordinary ecosystems. One thing that really appealed to me about oceanography was that it's very multidisciplinary by nature. Um, I get to work and use a huge range of tools from a variety of fields such as those listed here. Um, and another reason I enjoy this work is because uh, studying this microbial life in the deep ocean has connections to issues much larger than my driving research question, which we'll um, go over as well. So these include a bunch of subjects that I'm going to revisit uh, after we get through the research. So hopefully those videos, those images, they help you understand that there's a really big diversity of rocky seafloor habitats on Earth and that many of these sites look different from one another. And the reason they look different from one another is that the underlying rock and tectonic setting is different. So the nature of the chemical reactions is different. And so really everything I do in my lab is trying to understand how microbial life works at the bottom of the ocean to kind of understand that basic process and interaction between life, rocks, and water. Um, now I put this question here, question mark next to life, um, because there are places on our planet that are energy rich, but some other basic requirement for life is not met, uh, such as the temperature being too high, the conditions being too acidic. Um, so life can't take that energy away. 
So those black smokers are a really good example. They were close to 350 degrees Celsius and life cannot survive those temperatures, even though they're chock full of chemical energy. So just two examples of this very basic equation at the top here. Um, what I'm showing here on the left is, uh, you know, a very highly stylized version of what oceanic crust looks like with basaltic rocks, um, dikes that deliver that volcanic rock to the seafloor and deeper rocks within, within the mantle. Um, so when this type of rock, basalt or mafic, which is like what you've seen if you've looked at the eruption on Kilauea in Hawaii, for example, when this reacts with water at high temperature, you get things like hydrogen sulfide and iron, and that is what those beautiful black smokers um, are precipitating out. But if you take these deeper mantle rocks, which often get thrust up onto the surface due to um, severe faulting, you actually get very different end products. These are called ultramafic rocks, and you get things like hydrogen, methane, simple organic compounds. Um, and so in turn, those different energy sources uh, support different types of life. So I'm going to get a little bit into um, an example research project, and I hope I've hit the right target here. But what I really want you to understand is kind of what we actually do in the lab with this sort of fanciful question, right, which doesn't seem very constrained. But every once in a while, we actually generate a hypothesis and can test it. Um, so I, I want you to understand what this reaction between water and rock means for life and how just knowing what energy is available can help us constrain what's possible. So what I'm showing here are chemical reactions that microbes use to gain energy. So microbes basically pass electrons between a donor and an acceptor and that produces energy for growth. So here I'm showing one of those compounds in the reaction that the microbes use that's derived from the water rock reactions. Those are the ones in color. So hydrogen sulfide, methane, hydrogen, and iron sulfides. Uh, this first set of reactions, these all run with oxygen, which there's lots of oxygen in the deep ocean. Uh, and this second set runs without oxygen. So these are anaerobes um, that generally speaking don't tolerate oxygen very well. And we think they live in the deeper, hotter parts of the ocean crust environment. Almost all of these organisms are also autotrophs or capable of autotrophy. Again, meaning they fix their own carbon rather than get that carbon from other organisms. So we call them hemolithoautotrophs again. And so, you know, a kind of a, a basic question is really how do these processes vary across different hydrothermal event environments uh, on, on our planet? And uh, about a, a decade ago, a paper came out that made some predictions of what should be in different places just based on chemistry. So this was a comprehensive modeling effort of basically on the y-axis, the predicted energy available for life to extract. And these are a bunch of different, at the time, known hydrothermal vents in the oceans. Um, and again, those, those uh, microbial metabolisms I showed you on the last slide. So these are two mainly two different types of hard rock environments, which I introduced in my examples. One are these mafic in pink, these settings where it's basaltic rock reacting. You get a lot of sulfide, that's what's in red. And generally speaking, you have low methane and low hydrogen concentrations. And that's in contrast to what we have here in green, these ultra mafic settings where you do get a lot of methane and a lot of hydrogen. So this set up a hypothesis that we could test. This was a prediction based on modeling. Um, and so the two hypotheses generated from this paper for those of us who go in the field was that ultramafic systems should host more types of microbes and more metabolic strategies because there's more energy available, right? The bars were taller. Um, and that different rock types will host different microbial metabolisms, again, based on that chemistry. So around the time that that paper was published, I was part of an expedition that just happened to discover two new sites. Uh, they're both located in the Mid Cayman Rise, which is located here, south of Grand Cayman Island. Uh, this was originally a NASA project. It has now been supported by uh, NSF, the Sloan Foundation, as well as Schmidt Ocean Institute. And we found two different sites. <clears throat> One of them is named Von Dam, and it's an ultramafic system. Uh, it's located at about 2300 meters and it's on top of this large outcrop which is host to ultramafic rocks. The other site which is only about 20 kilometers away is much deeper. It's the world's deepest known hydrothermal vent. It's called Picard and it's hosted in these mafic or basalt rocks. 
So here we have the opportunity within 20 kilometers to test those hypotheses generated by the modeling paper. So the first thing my colleagues and I did is collected a bunch of samples to measure the chemistry. And this is work mostly done by my colleague here at Huey, Jeff Seewald, and his, uh, at the time, graduate student, Jill McDermott. And what I want you to see is kind of where the big differences are. So one of the big differences was in the pH. It got very acidic over here at Mafic, uh, in the Mafic system and Picard. But interestingly, both of them had these really high hydrogen concentrations. Um, this is the highest recorded hydrogen concentration in a MAFIC hosted system. But the carbon chemistry of the two, it was really, really different. Um, basically, there was a ton of methane at this ultra MAFIC system. A lot of these simple carbon things like formate and hydrocarbons, which were very sparse at the MAFIC system. So from these same samples, we then said, okay, what are the microbes doing here, right? And how does this compare to the original hypothesis? But before we did that, we decided to repeat this modeling exercise and we added a few more um, metabolisms in here than the original paper. And we saw basically the same results. So again, on the y-axis is the available energy. So the taller the bar, the more energy that's available. Uh, and we broadly see the same things as the original papers, but we added in these two new sites, the Von Dam and the Picard site. So what we found is that Von Dam fall, fell as expected within this ultra mafic group where there's just a huge amount of energy available. There's more diverse metabolisms because of all that unique carbon chemistry. And in fact, it was the highest among all the known ultra mafic sites at the time. And then we had the previously known mafic sites, but you can see that here in the middle is this newly discovered world's deepest hydrothermal vent site, Picard, which kind of doesn't fit in with either of those end members, right? That's because it's mafic hosted, but has this crazy high hydrogen concentration. So we already are finding that, you know, we can model things, we can predict things, but it's very hard to predict things you don't even know about, right? That they exist on our planet, uh, which is a great argument for continuing to explore our own planet. So now we have our own hypothesis, which is a little bit different uh, because we have this new system, right? That didn't fit in to sort of the canonical view of how vents work. So we did do, in my lab, we do a lot of molecular biology um, and I'm not gonna get into all that, but we use a lot of the powers of DNA sequencing and RNA sequencing and computational biology. All I want you to really understand on this figure is that the different colors represent different types of microbes. So it's, pretty obvious just from looking that there are more different and uh, more different colors basically over here in the ultra mafic site versus at the mafic site. So this is consistent with that original hypothesis that an ultra mafic system has more energy available so it's going to host more diverse and different microbes. However, when we kind of dug into this uh, and also looked at function, what we actually found is despite having different microbes, they're actually pretty much doing the same thing. They're different populations, but they're actually carrying out very similar metabolisms. And that's somewhat consistent with those, um, those predictions, but not totally. So basically, if we go back to that original hypothesis, you know, yes, we saw that there are more types of microbes, more metabolic strategies uh, in these ultramafic systems, but the second hypothesis didn't really hold up. Um, these different rock types actually hosted the different, uh, actually hosted very similar metabolisms. And we think the reason is because hydrogen trumps rock. Like hydrogen is just this really delicious thing. It's energy rich. And if it's there, microbes will eat it. And so that kind of unified these two sites despite totally different depths, temperatures, pH, carbon chemistry, and rock type. So I like telling this story because I think it's a not only does it highlight all the different tools we use from modeling to chemistry to geology and microbiology, but also it really highlights how, how little we know, I would say, uh, until we get out there and make some discoveries. So now what I wanna do uh, is not so much talk about my research, but turn to these other topics that I mentioned um, that my work touches on. And I wanna start with astrobiology and planetary science. So 
In the last 20 years, maybe we've learned a lot about our solar system. Uh, we now know there are a myriad of oceans. Earth is no longer unique in having an ocean. So shown here is Earth with planetary bodies in our solar system thought to have a liquid ocean. And given a liquid media is thought to be critical to supporting life on, uh, here on Earth, this is kind of a critical discovery that's opened a lot of possibilities for a search for life beyond. Um, so by studying life in the deep ocean on Earth, maybe we can help answer this really fundamental question uh, that humankind has been asking for as long as it's really existed. You know, is life unique to Earth? Uh, are we alone? And this is very focused on our solar system, right? I'm not talking about exoplanets or other systems. So right now I've been serving as the sole oceanographer uh, and biologist actually on the steering committee for the National Academy of Scientists. Uh, every 10 years, they go through this exercise um, and do a decadal survey of planetary science. And this is the first year they've actually included astrobiology. Uh, and this is to kind of set the priorities for Congress on what to fund in planetary science. Um, and it has been a very interesting experience for me as kind of an outsider to the planetary science community but they also explicitly included astrobiology because it's in recognition now that the search for life both here on Earth and beyond has really become an essential part of both the research and the mission portfolio at NASA. And actually NASA is what first brought me to Woods Hole um, as a postdoc many years ago. So I wanna give you a very specific example to connect the microbes we study here on Earth to those that might exist beyond Earth. So as we've already talked about, we know that these hydrothermal vents on Earth, that there are these microbes that live without oxygen, without any connection to this sunlit ocean world. Uh, so this is one example. I had it in my previous slide, but this is a methanogen. Uh, this microbe is an archaea. It carries out a process called methanogenesis, where it is basically taking hydrogen and carbon dioxide and making methane. This is a super successful um, metabolism on Earth. Uh, from the human gut to soils, to permafrost, to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, these organisms can live at these really huge range of temperatures. Um, the highest recorded growth of any organism on earth is actually a methanogen at 250 degrees. Uh, it was isolated from a deep sea hydrothermal vents and it can be grown uh, in an autoclave, which is used usually to sterilize things, but it likes growing at that temperature of about 121 degrees Celsius. So what does this have to do with life beyond? Well, um, I will give you a very specific example. Uh, when the Cassini mission flew through the plume of Enceladus, this is this really tiny but fascinating ocean world of Saturn, it actually found these exact same three ingredients. It found hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and methane. And extensive modeling of that data set suggests hydrothermal systems similar to what we actually found in the Caribbean Sea here on Earth might be the best analog for what's happening at this rocky core of Enceladus's ocean. Uh, so all of a sudden, Enceladus is satisfying a lot of our primary criteria for habitability, right? It has energy, it has water, it has a rocky seafloor, um, and that makes it one of the most promising locations to search for extraterrestrial life in our solar system. Right now, again, based on this kind of one mission, uh, the constraints on the pH, the temperature, the salinity suggest these are ranges tolerated by organisms on Earth. Methanogenesis might be happening. Right now, it looks like it might be a really high pH, like pH 10 or 11. We have very few organisms in, on Earth known to grow at that pH, but we do have a few. Um, we're studying one of them in my lab from a high pH soda lake and from Russia. And so the question is really, could a mission to Enceladus find evidence for such life? Um, you know, only time will tell, these are long range missions. But HUI is really at the lead of this new field of ocean worlds. Uh, so we have a number of large projects that are trying to bring together oceanographers, engineers, uh, planetary science modelers, and kind of answering this really fundamental question about life in the solar system. And while space exploration is definitely a great hook for getting people to care about the deep ocean, uh, there also are some new emergent uses of the crustal environment that I wanna kind of close on and think about how we can tackle uh, because the spatial scale of these activities could really dwarf all other known human impacts in the deep sea, including deep sea fishing and trawling. So this diagram shows these activities in various deep sea habitats. This is very much focused um, in terms of the big human perturbation on deep sea mining, 
and subsea floor carbon sequestration, which I'll talk about both of them. So we really don't know the resilience of these ecosystems to these types of perturbations. And in light of these potential activities, I really believe there's an urgent need for understanding the crustal ocean biosphere to inform potentially sustainable resource management or make a decision about whether or not extraction or sequestration is even a good idea. So we know, for example, that more metals are needed for a fossil-free future. They're increasingly needed for the manufacturing of lithium ion batteries and our communication devices, our technical infrastructure. We also know that the deep sea has a lot of mineral resources. So crustal ocean rocks and the mineral deposits they host, they can contain high concentrations of economically valuable elements. This includes cobalt, copper, rare earth elements, and the global market for these elements is definitely growing exponentially, which has really reinvigorated this discussion of deep sea mining. So despite there being critical knowledge and technology gaps, uh, deep sea mining trials are already underway. And as I'll discuss, some draft regulations for such mining code are being written. The other thing that we think about in the deep ocean is carbon sequestration. Uh, we know that we need to reduce carbon dioxide emissions to limit global warming as illustrated here. Uh, so on the x-axis here is the next you know, 80 years or so and the billion tons of CO2 that we need to get to achieve zero emissions. So this is a really dramatic reduction that is needed and one potential negative emission technology being considered is carbon sequestration. Um, this is the idea of injecting CO2 into the crust in either a dissolved or liquid phase, and that's then converted into a solid carbonate mineral within crustal fractures. Um, I can see my, I, this, both of these slides are from this organization called solidcarbon.ca, a Canadian effort um, to do some trials, scientific trials on this to see if it's worth doing. Um, they already do this, for example, up in Iceland, but it's all exposed, right? They live basically on a volcanic continent. Um, and so this is very different in terms of having to pump the rock into the seafloor, pump, excuse me, the CO2 into the seafloor. And really the role of the crustal ocean biosphere in either accelerating or mitigating that process is, is really poorly understood and, and barely studied. So I would argue that we need to act now to address these critical knowledge gaps in this global deep sea environment. Uh, we need to inform decision-making related to this industry. So we know these ecosystem services occur, but we really don't know the magnitude of them. And we all know we need to put dollar amounts on things so that they're valued. So these services need to be measured in a way that translates into dollars. Um, and then we need to determine the resilience of this ecosystem to perturbation and decide you know, what can it handle and what are the mitigation strategies to prevent serious harm. Now, a lot of those environments I showed you, they're super dynamic, right? They are used to natural perturbation, but a natural perturbation like an eruption is very different than scraping away the entire top of a volcanic seamount, for example. So we need to determine the resilience of these ecosystems, um, strategies to mitigate harm, and we really need to expand our relatively small and homogenous scientific community that works and cares about the deep sea. And this includes both scientists and stakeholders, such um, policymakers, industry spe uh, specialists, government officials, and educators. And probably the part of this puzzle that maybe you've seen in the headlines is uh, deep sea mining. So this has been in the headlines a lot, actually. Uh, the, this is from last spring, and then these were from the summer. <clears throat> so that is because. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on <laughs> in the political landscape. So a lot of our ocean is actually doesn't belong to anybody or you could flip that and say it belongs to all of us. Um, it is the high seas, the international seas. So uh, like I already mentioned, deep sea mining trials are already underway uh, and draft regulations for some of this code are being written. And this is all happening within a relatively small unknown group in the United Nations called the International Seabed Authority or the ISA. And uh, these headlines reflect kind of a troubling uh, development that came to light this summer, which has really become an international political hot button issue. We could spend a lot of time talking about it. We are clearly at a, a tipping point. 
So while some industries and scientists have backed a moratorium on deep sea mining, such as BMW and Volvo up there on the left, um, private entities have partnered with small Pacific island nations that have really been ravaged by decades of terrestrial mining. And these private entities um, are looking to mine their regional waters. And this past summer, Nauru, which is a small Pacific island, uh, has triggered this sort of obscure two-year rule at the ISA, basically saying if you don't have regulations in place in two years, you have to let us do it with whatever regulations are in there. And of course, this is all happening in the time of COVID when an in-person ISA meeting has not happened. Uh, the ISA is headquartered in Jamaica. I will say that um, this is from uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. D. Valman, uh, who's very involved in the policy side of this. And she just tweeted this yesterday, actually. Um, Twitter is a wonderful place to keep track of actually what's going on with DC mining. Um, that, that Microsoft also has sort of joined this industrial moratorium on using mineral resources from the deep sea until the proper research and scientific studies uh, have been completed. I don't know how Diva found that. It was on page 35 of some sustainability report. Um, but you know, if, if a lot of these big industries uh, say no, then it is not gonna be financially uh, viable. So basically the race is on. Uh, we need to act now to address these knowledge gaps. We need to inform the decision-making related to these industries. We need to understand resilience and perturbation. And there's really this, this, this urgent need for informing uh, sustainable resource management, which as we all know, you know, a lot of the ocean needs. But, you know, just like sending a mission to Enceladus to search for life beyond Earth, you know, these are really big questions. They're grand challenges in the coming decades. Um, I personally believe we have the scientific and technological tools to rise to these challenges, uh, but we really need to expand this relatively small and homogenous scientific community across the world to tackle these issues. Uh, so like many of you, I and others in the Woods Hole community, we've been working hard to bring diverse stakeholders to the table. And especially during this year, uh, the past year and a half, whatever it's been, um, people are more disconnected and out of touch. And so, Many of my own efforts in the lab that was mentioned in the introduction have really focused on uh, bringing community college students to the lab. This is a program we've been running since about 2015 to give these students paid research opportunities uh, at HUI. I previously run this program at the MBL. Um, and this summer we had six undergrads, uh, four community college students, and then we had a student from Hampton University and another from Oregon State. They actually spent most of their summer, the first half of it on Zoom, uh, doing computational biology projects, which was fun, but not as fun as spending the summer in Woods Hole. Um, but by you know uh, early August, we were able to bring them kind of off of Zoom and we took them down to see Alvin. That's what's shown there in the upper left. Um, so you know this was kind of their first time to really be physically uh, involved in oceanography and it was a really huge frame shift for them. From hearing about these things in lectures uh, while working remotely to being on the dock, looking at the inside of the sphere, uh, the research vessel, Neil Armstrong was, was in town and our tour guide was Nick. He's over there on the far left. Um, he was actually a student who started as a community college student in my lab in 2015. He didn't know if he liked biology or engineering and I said, my lab's a great place for you. Uh, he ended up getting his mechanical engineering degree uh, and he's actually now a pilot in training with the Elvin Group. Um, so he's just a wonderful inspiration for our students. Many of our students have gone on to four-year colleges, completed degrees in STEM, pursuing those careers. Uh, and, you know, I think this is so important because these are the students, these are the people who are going to be analyzing that data from Enceladus, right? It's not going to be me. I'm going to be retired, uh, hopefully living someplace warm. Um, and they're really the future ambassadors for the deep ocean. We need them, we need others like them from around the globe for ocean science to really thrive and cross these political, societal, and cultural borders. So just to close, you know, I think the deep sea is really this kind of last frontier in earth. And we actually know the science we need for the ocean we want, uh, but we need to really accelerate the exploration and characterization of the deep ocean and we need to train the next generation of these scientists, engineers, policymakers, and communicators and educators. So uh, I would argue we've really barely scratched the bottom of the sea. And this is one of my favorite NASA images. This is from the Lunar Reconnaissance Rover. 
This was taken in 2015, looking back at this remarkable planet that we have. Um, and it's really just a treasure trove waiting for discovery. So with that, I am done. Thank you, Julie, so much. Um, we do have some questions. I'm basically just going to run right down the list. Um, we may not get to them all because we want to make sure that we um, have enough time for you to get to your next session. Um, so the first question is from Bob, and he asks, are there some compelling stories that can engage the public in these deep sea issues? Charismatic megafauna or charismatic mega rock structures or charismatic microbes? <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm hopeful that I, you know, put some, some charismatic footage in there and charismatic stories. Um, I, you know, one of the reasons um, I find Ocean World so compelling, it's a really great public uh, way. It's, people care so much about space um, and it's a wonderful way to get people thinking about the deep ocean. So actually some of my highest profile communication has been, you know, with Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye, we want to talk about space and my job is always to get them talking about the ocean. Um, but I do think, you know, the footage, the idea of using, you know, using energy without the sun, thinking about weird alien life. I think it's personally, I find it very compelling and a wonderful hook to bring in more people. Sorry, Meredith asks, uh, wait, no, I'm sorry. Wrong question. <laughs> Uh, the next question I have is from Valerie. She asks, when comparing the deep sea food web with the photic zone food web, food web are the same biomolecules, proteins, carbohydrates, et cetera, produced and transferred, or are they different? Yeah, that's a really, a really good question. Um, what we actually haven't characterized organic matter coming out of hydrothermal vents very thoroughly the way we have in the surface ocean. But we, what we do know is that, you know, this new organic matter is produced in the surface ocean and all the good stuff gets all the good stuff, right? Like maybe all the high calorie, high quality carbon gets consumed very quickly. And by the time you get to the deep sea, what you're often left with is what we call refractory or really kind of like not that delicious, right? Um, and that carbon can stick around in the ocean for thousands of years. And we actually think that there are microbes that can eat almost all the carbon, both in the surface and the deep ocean. But when you get to the deep ocean, you sort of have an encounter rate problem, right? There's less biomass, there's less carbon, and so these very specialized or organisms um, who, you know, develop the enzymes to break down that carbon, they just have to have, they have to find each other, and it can take a much longer time. Uh, so I've been working with some organic geochemists on sort of, instead of like, sequencing the DNA, they basically, you know, do these huge mass specs of all the organic molecules in the deep ocean. Uh, and there's just tons of things that we don't really know what they are and who can eat them, but we can see them disappear in other places. So it is very fundamentally different um, when comparing the photic and the, and the deep ocean. It's a really good question. Val also asks, in the photo of the remelted submarine plate, I noticed some yellow material. Was that biotic or abiotic? It's actually molten sulfur, uh, so abiotic. Super cool. Uh, sulfur has a pretty low melting temperature. Um, and sometimes it can be yellow, sometimes it can be gray or black, depending on the purity. But that has to do with when the plate remelts and it's quite shallow in the arc and how it comes back to the surface. Um, yeah, it's a very strange place, that volcano. Bob asks, how would we know if another planet can support life? Kids ask a lot of questions about extraterrestrial life. Also, does climate change impact deep sea ecosystems? Well, I think you're gonna hear a good bit about climate change in the deep sea. I see Randy's on here now. And um, Randy is actually part of our new research accelerator on the deep ocean also. Uh, climate change does impact the deep sea. I'll answer that. First of all, it's been slower to see the signal um, because it's just buffered and it's further away from the action. Uh, but, you know, we have been studying, for example, changes in acidity and export of carbon, and we do see these changes. 
For the first question, uh, Bob, hopefully I got to it a little bit about whether or not these planets can support life. Uh, NASA has a very triaged approach, really looking at the habitability. So the hydrogen methane example I gave from Enceladus, uh, but also really talking about running missions uh, that explicitly look for life as part of that habitability search, which is something NASA has never done. They've always, it's been a geologic mission, but you know, they're looking for methane signatures or Cassini was not a life finder mission, for example, yet it found signatures of habitability. But what is on the table, there's a lot of pro pro proposed missions that are explicitly collecting samples to look for life. So the, the Mars rover that's up there right now, um, per Perseverance, I believe, you know, it is caching samples that are eventually going to come back to Earth and be analyzed for signs of past life. Um, and that will be the first sample return mission related to life that we've ever had. Um, we're still, I think, a good decade out from those samples coming back. Um, but those are the types of things. The ocean worlds are so far away that bringing the samples back isn't possible. And so the missions that we're looking at uh, have in-situ life detectors elements to them, whether it's looking at chirality of amino acids or looking at certain organic compounds or even one proposal um, involved doing some uh, DNA detection. So it's, it's a pretty wide range of possibilities. Uh, Eowyn asks, what was the link for that carbon se se yes. se sequestration organization? Wow, I cannot yeah. talk. <laughs> That was a solidcarbon.ca. Again, it's a Canadian group. They haven't started doing that, just to be clear. They're trying to raise money to do it um, in the, um, the Canadians actually have a hydrothermal vent protected area, a, a national protected area um, that they would like to do the experiment in. Um, so it's being run out of uh, University of Victoria. This will be unfortunately probably the last question we can get to. Um, but Mia asks, what kinds of potential risks do you and your lab hypothesize to the deep sea or ecosystems with injected CO2 into the seafloor being released through vents? Yeah, I mean, it's a really great question because it's not something we've done before. Um, and it takes a lot of energy, right, to liquefy and move that CO2 from the atmosphere 2000 meters into the crust. Uh, so some of the hazards I think about is just kind of like space. Um, parts of ocean crust are very porous and fractured and I'm at, and there's a lot of space for mineralization and precipitation. Other is not, it's not very permeable. And so I worry about us trying to, you know, stick something down and it just coming back. Uh, I also think a lot, you know, we mainly study autotrophs in my lab, organisms that fix CO2, and now we're going to inject a bunch of CO2. And that's, you know, a natural experiment is when an eruption occurs, you get a lot of new volatile gases, and we see a huge bump in primary productivity in these ecosystems. It's just like around here when, you know, when summer, spring comes, the sun's out longer, and the waters become more productive. The same thing happens with these deep sea eruptions where you sort of an injection of energy and a lot of these autotrophs, they bloom. So what's gonna happen when we put all the CO2 down there uh, with these organisms? Uh, are you gonna have some sort of artificial perturbation? Um, but I am, we are recently as part of this new NSF program reaching out to the Canadian group, looking more into what Iceland's been doing, for example, to really try to understand um, what could happen. And also, you know, I'm not an economist, right? Ultimately all this deep sea mining, this comes down to money. You know, if it doesn't make sense financially, people aren't gonna do it. Uh, so making sure, you know, those, those types of folks are really engaged and uh, can help us figure out whether or not it's quote unquote worth it, right? Um, but putting value on these things is the first step. Well, thank you, Julie. I just want to remind you all that um, if we didn't get to your question, you can add it to the Hoover app um, and we can get we can get it to um, Dr. Hoover. Um, and otherwise, I think we're ready for our next sessions. So you will need to log off this Zoom and log on to the new Zooms so that we all, you know, can get to the right places. Have a fabulous day. Thank you, Julie.